Greetings, unsettled souls, and welcome to The Correct Views, low-def listeners live there, high-def up there. If you are not or watching this live, you're going to want to go to the high-def, but in any event, we appreciate you tuning in. You might hear Christelle adjusting the mic. Uh, friends, let me tell you what, but today's been quite a day. You're going to get some like personal commentary stuff today. Um, for one thing, I had the honor of DJing a rave uh, for the last seven and a half hours. Uh, I'll, t I'll tell you something interesting when you do that. Um, have you ever tried to beat match for seven hours? It, I've done it for three, I've done it for four. Seven hours, it was, it was insane, but it was a lot of fun, and everybody left uh, happy for the most part. So, it was a success. I was going to postpone doing a show tonight because I didn't get to promote the last one very well. Then I decided, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask all my listeners tonight to kindly promote last show and this show <laughs> because I was busy, you know, out making a living. So please, uh, by all means, uh, share the show and share the one prior. And we're going to get into today's news. Um, there's going to be personal commentary peppered throughout this because... A lot of the news I'm giving you, I can prove on a very personal basis to be that which I'm saying that it is. Um, also, I don't think people realize, you're going to see the name maybe on the, um, the title of the show and it says mention something economy. So the first thing you want to do is zone out or the high def listeners want to scan ahead to the other news. Don't do that because a lot of what I'm going to address here, and this may be a bit of a long show, but I can promise you it's also going to be an interesting one. If I can do it after a seven and a half hour rave, then stay with me, you will be happy that you did. Um, no, I hear the question, are yeah, you yeah, on ecstasy? No, I DJ'd the rave, I didn't attend it. Uh, government regulation and economic stagnation. Creeping regulations lead to economic slowdowns. I know a lot of you are going to think, you know, economy not going to be interesting. This is one of the most easy to understand reports and articles that I've ever read on anything related to economy. Um, economics as a whole, I should say. Listen to this. One of the more interesting economic debates in the past couple of decades is why the economy is slowing down. Since 2000, per capita GDP growth in the U.S. has been 0.09% per year, compared to a 2.3% per year in the previous 50 years. What does that mean? It says this is a big difference, because at 2.3% growth, we as a nation double in wealth every generation. At 0.09%, where we're at now, and have been since 2000, that'd be 15 years for you Usher fans, it takes us close to a century to double. So instead of doing it every year, or every generation, we now do it every 100 years. Are you seeing a problem here? It says, so why the slowdown? Well, there's usually, when you get into these kind of articles, what you run into is nine kinds of confusion and doublespeak and complication. That's not what you're getting in this report. This is a really good one. It says, even fresh young blogger Ben Bernanke is on the game with his new blog, while Tyler Cowen has written a mini-book on the subject called The Great Stagnation. One thing that most economists, left and right, agree on is that it takes investment to make an economy more productive. Somebody has to put the money into the business for the business to grow, for them to be a business says, naturally, economists focus on investment rates, which have indeed come down across the most of the industrial world, mirroring the U.S. in numbers above. But it says that there are misplaced fears of hoarding and deflation. Now listen to this. Listen to how the Keynesians, that's an economic theory that is incorrect. What's the correct one? The Austrian theory. Uh, Keynesians believe that saving money is bad. They believe that if you buy gold or silver or platinum or copper or whatever, I'm allergic to copper, no, um, they think that by doing so you're hurting the economy because you're supposed to be buying big screen TVs and uh, bling and yo-yo, got me a caddy, yo, can't afford the payments, so I'm selling, you know, whatever because I'm buried in debt. 
it's not the way we're supposed to live. Well, Keynesians don't want you to keep your money. They call it hoarding it. No, it's saving it. You don't want it in banks. Don't put your money in a bank. Put your money in a bank. You know what they're going to do? They're going to give you almost no interest. At some point, they're going to charge you just for keeping it in. That's known as negative interest. And they're to charge you at ATMs to take it out. You usually spend more in ATM fees in any given year than you make from the in interest on the money that you have in the bank. A much better route is to buy gold, silver, and platinum. Um, and for those of you not allergic, copper. Um, the way that you, you want to tend to stay away from what it is that Keynesians want you to do. The goal is to save for the future because, um, and I just had this discussion with someone the other day, people go through life with this, this image that uh, nothing bad ever happens to them. And it always happens to somebody else. All you care about is money. Well, it's money that they are going to take when you haven't saved for some kind of a disaster. And one of the best ways to do that is by avoiding the banks. And for those that owe money in student loans, if you have money in a bank or a Roth IRA or a mutual fund, they're going to take the money out of the account. They can't do this if you buy gold, silver, or platinum with, say, a money order. You see where I'm going here? It says the Keynesians, any problem is a demand problem. It's their one hammer that solves all of them. So the position of Bernanke, Summers, and the ever-present Krugman is, with minor adjustments, that there's too much savings sloshing around in this world instead of being invested. That savings acts as a dead weight on productivity improvements. Savings, for both Keynesians who are wrong and Austrians who are right, means the money not spent on consumption, that is, buying things that you probably don't need. Keynesians miss that you do two very different things with savings. You can hoard it or you can invest it. Hoarding means you secret it away and that terrifies Keynesians. Investing means you indeed spend the money on some productive good or service, such as your future. And again, this, is, this was uh, Ron Paul's belief as well, and I'm pretty sure it's Rand's. Um, when the Keynesians complain about dead money, they mean there's too much hoarding. Please, 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 please listen to this. This completely misunderstands how hoarded savings affect investment. A dollar that's unspent is equivalent to temporarily removing that dollar from existence. You see why. You may well have buried it. This means that all remaining dollars increase in value. For instance, I got lucky enough to meet Rob Halford. He's a very, very hard person to meet. He's very English and very proper and doesn't really talk a lot. He's very, very hard to get to meet. I got a Judas Priest autograph. No, I'm not selling it. No, no, no. But if I had the chance to, it would be worth a lot more than somebody that's very easy to meet. And I'm not saying you, you, you look at your, uh, your, your rocks, your, your celebrities, or the people that you admire in terms of money. I'm just speaking on economics here, using an analogy. That wouldn't be so with someone that's very easy to meet, somebody that spends a lot of time talking to their fans, uh, a sheep on drugs, for instance. Um, there's not many going around. Well, that's what they're saying here. Money goes up in value when people quote unquote hoard money. You see why? It says to illustrate this, say you've got a hundred billion running around the economy and you burn 25 billion. What happens? The remaining 75 billion do the work of the original 100. Meaning each dollar rises in value by 33%. Now if instead of burning that money you hoarded it instead, the impact is exactly the same. The remaining dollars in circulation rise in value. You get deflation. You still get your 100 billion spent. It's just being accomplished with fewer pieces of paper. That is the clearest understanding of Austrian economics and why Keynesianism is so unbelievably wrong that I have ever read. Do you see why I had to cover this today? 
It says hoarding merely transfers purchasing power to dollars that are still in circulation, meaning that Keynesian bugbear of saving gluts have no impact on investment because hoarding cancels itself out by purchasing power adjustment. That is the remaining dollars going up in value to cover for that which was taken. Now I want to get into the next part of this as well because this is where I can tell you firsthand I've lived this. It's true. It says the role of regulation. It says what is causing the slowdown? Cowan, who is among the few mainstream economists actually trained in Austrian economics, gets closer to what I think is the true cause when he looks at supply side problems, that is our side. Still, I think he's missing the obvious. Cohen claims that we have plucked the low-hanging fruit, that would be excess land on the frontier and the basic education of our kids. And now we just have to suck it up and get used to what he calls the new normal. It says the problem, though, here is timing. The frontier, quote-unquote, closed over a century ago actually before the greatest leap in U.S. economic, that of course was the Gilded Age, uh, that is the time period of the uh, Titanic, before the Titanic. The Gilded Age came uh, to a crash shortly after uh, the Titanic. Literacy rates too leveled off a century too early. I suspect a statistics analysis would say that by sheer coincidence, the exact opposite of what Cohen said occurred. No, it wasn't caused, it was a coincidence. Economic growth soared once the frontier closed and literally re literacy rates leveled off. So then, what's causing the sh slowdown? It says we need nothing. We need something that actually occurred in the right time frame. And he writes, for me, the problem is pretty obvious. Creeping regulation, ding, ding, ding. It's hard to quantify the impact of regulations. And that's where I'm going to be speaking to you at in a minute. How do we measure a regulation against, say, selling secret, uh, selling, excuse me, street food or braiding hair without a license? We need to use proxies. Now listen to this real quick. They use the analogy here of uh, selling street food and braiding hair, and I've covered this before, but I want it to be very concise in one spot because I'm probably going to be referring to this video quite a bit. You should not have to get a license to sell food on the street. You eat if you poison somebody. We already have laws against poisoning somebody. If you poison somebody on accident, that's called involuntary manslaughter. How long do you think a street vendor is going to be able to sell hot dogs after the first person dies? If people start getting the poops and they're running to the toilet, guess what? He's not going to have a business. Braiding hair without a license. Isn't it up to the person who is getting their hair did, or the person that is didding the hair? Isn't it up to the person that works there and the person getting their hair done? Isn't it up to them if this person does the other person's hair? Why should there need to be a license from the government? The government should not be involved in this transaction or the decisions in the transaction whatsoever. None. They have no business in it. What's the personal story? Um, I want to give a shout out to Buzzbin Mike because the story I'm about to tell is uh, not a reflection on Buzzbin Mike, but it's happened twice <laughs> and it's interesting. I have been telling people for eons that a club in Canton, Ohio would work and I begged and implored for like 10 years for someone to help me do this. Everyone said it wouldn't work, it wouldn't work. Meanwhile, there's like no place to go. God loves Sadie Renee's, but they're in love with cover bands, and people really weren't going there because they were so tired of hearing cover bands. They wanted original music. The original bands they put on Sunday or Wednesday, which nobody came to. So, Buzzbin Mike opened up a club, and guess what? It did exactly what I said it would do. It now owns Canton. If you're in Canton, Ohio, you've almost got to play Buzzbin. Um, and again, God bless Mike, that's not what I mean. My point is, my brother and I would have long opened a club, but you've got regulations on liquor, you've got regulations on food, and this and that, and this and that. And what you've created is a 
country where it is absolutely impossible for anybody who doesn't have an amazing amount of money, liquor licenses can be anywhere from ten to a hundred thousand dollars. If you don't have a lot of money, you can't do it at all. And it, you know, streets uh, selling street food, braiding hair, it's all the same thing. This is the kind of thing that brings the entire economy to an absolute crash. So you mean to tell me if I have one of my friends do my hair at work? Christelle, my friends. Uh, they need to have a license or they can uh, get a They can not open up a shop. Selling ah. it. They're not, the government somehow thinks it's up to them to decide whether or not this person should be allowed to have a business. Instead of letting the people who are going to this business decide whether or not they wish to return or if they find this person reputable, the government decides that they need to make that decision for you. And what this has done is bring the economy to a halt. Okay. It says here's a chart of the annual number of pages in the Federal Register. This is a proxy of how many rules come up, which in turn a proxy for the regulatory burden. These took a huge jump starting in the 1970s, briefly interrupted by Carter's deregulation drive, then resumed their march upward in the 1980s. What went upward? The amount of things that stop you and I from being able to open up our own businesses. Comparing the productivity numbers to regulatory pages matches up pretty well. Pre-1971, GDP ran at 2.4%, which again is, is more than we need to double the wealth of us all in a generation. But it says since 1971, it runs at 1.8%. That's a lot less. Still, the big drop-off since 2001 isn't simply explained by pages. There was no big jump in 2000 in Federal Register pages. So the timing's not perfect, but there are other comparisons that we should look at as well. Specifically, we need to look at other countries because of what their view causes the slowdown will change. But what are other countries doing? I'll tell you what. It says, um, let's get this real quick. Interesting are the three countries that actually passed the U.S. That is, did better than the U.S., Supposedly worldwide stagnation. So in other words, they said everybody was stagnant. Were they? Has everybody been stagnant for the last 15 years? Well, let's look. Singapore, Australia, and Switzerland. Singapore only passed the U.S. in per capita income in 2011. Australia did it in 2010. And even Switzerland at the same income as the U.S. in 2000. And now it's nearly 50% richer than we are says, what's so special about these countries? In general, there's almost nothing that, 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 say, Australia, Singapore, and Switzerland have in common. Their language is different, the size of the country is different, different resources, different structure to their economy, and a completely different type of government. What they do have in common, though, is low regulatory burdens, which is what I talked about, which is why I don't own a club today. Limited governments, which we do not have, and the rule of law. In fact, both Switzerland and Singapore are regularly threatened by the U.S. as tax havens. If indeed it's this relatively business-friendly attitude that lets some countries escape the supposed great stagnation that has been with us for 15 years, then we have yet another reason to doubt the policy prescriptions of the summers Bernanke recruitment position. position. Rather, than the expanded government role in lending or Cohen's pessimism, the solution is clear. Put as much effort into removing regulatory and tax deadweight as we put into hatching new burdens. Open up the door for people to do things, and they will do them greatly. That is the way that America was built. And the reason that that has been stopped is that our politicians have moved in and castrated the Constitution. A lot more to get to, friends. How many of you realize that one of the best things you can do by now is to keep your money out of a bank? I gave you some reasons earlier. Look up How to Live Without Banks, Mediaspeaks.com. It's a free article I have up, and it teaches you how to do exactly what the name says. Does it work? Yes, it works. I do it every day of my life. Um, it says, once cash is banned, they will be able to force you to buy products. Just tax their excess access. Just tax their excess amount balance. Well, let me tell you what. 
They're saying that if they ban cash, that you will have to put your money in a bank and you'll have to spend money off debit cards. So anytime they want to tax you or anytime they want to give you a haircut for the good of the economy or anytime they want to give you negative interest rates, which charges you to have your money in the bank, they will be able to just do so because cash won't be accepted anywhere. Well, let me tell you what, friends, before I get into this story, because you're listening, and if you hear this, leave a comment and tell me you heard it because you're going to love it. When they ban cash, I, Sam I. B. Ganji, am going to tell you exactly how to get around it. What you do is you take your handy dandy bank card that you have to have, and you take your spending money, and you buy gold, silver, or platinum. You then sell it. All you need to prove that you sold it is a receipt. So when you buy your gold, silver, platinum, and if you're not allergic to a copper, you sell it. At least the receipt says you sold it. And you can sit on it and invest in it and spend it. And you can undermine the banks entirely. Do you understand yet why this is called the correct views? Because when they ban cash, I just told you how to get around it. Hit subscribe. In recent weeks, this is according to Max Slavo, shtfplan.com, we've seen numerous reports on how banks are actively working with governments to restrict cash usage. J.P. Morgan Chase, one of the world's largest banks, has advised their customers that storing cash in their safe deposit boxes is no longer allowed. For your safety, of course. Well, you know, invest gold, silver, and uh, see if you can find some place to keep it. Like, bury it. You mean to tell me you can't find a place to hide 10 ounces of gold? What are you, an idiot? It says the new policy sounds ridiculous, but makes complete sense when you consider that you would then be left with no other choice than to hold your money exclusively in the bank account, where the bank will simply charge you for the privilege of depositing your funds into their financial institution. Well, there's a link for it, but they won't be doing it to you if you listen to the correct views, because I just beat it. It says any normal working class individual would have the same reaction you have right now to this. Take your cash out of the bank. Well, that may sound like a great plan. It turns out that bank employees have been told that the government that they should be reporting to law enforcement officials any suspicious looking cash transactions, especially withdrawals, even if they are just for a couple of thousand dollars so that the enforcement agents can seize those funds. Well, if you take the money out of the bank and invested in gold and silver, you will only have the money in the bank that you need to live on and pay bills. All of your other money will be taken out and invested in gold and silver, which they cannot trace, especially if you buy it with a money order. Get it? Yet, they can't trace it. It says, uh, again, if you buy off a, pl a private person the gold and silver, you can actually say that you spent the money on anything you want to. Just take the gold and silver, then use the receipt for your taxes to say that you bought a car when you didn't. Or it wouldn't be a car. There's papers for that. But you know what I mean. You bought a, you bought a collector lamp or something. You know what I mean. You know exactly what I'm saying. Banks cannot track this if you use the thinking part of your brain. The banks want to ensure total control, and by controlling your cash flow, they control you. It's as simple as that. Well, they don't control me, and I taught you how to get out of it. As noted below, the ideal situation for the world's central bankers and governments is a total ban on cash transaction. Bring it! It is, after all, the 21st century. Who needs cash when you have debit card and phone payment systems? Plus, there's terrorism to contend with. And we all know that only terrorists and criminals and shady underworld types carry cash. Well, it's none of their business who's carrying cash. Because cash is cash is what people use when they don't want the banks spying on them. And the banks are a much bigger danger to most people than terrorists. It says, moreover, in the event the president or other bureaucrat declares a financial crisis, the government can move with unprecedented speed, and this happened in Cyprus, where they said it couldn't happen, to stabilize the symptom by simply compelling you to spend money to boost the economic activity. What does compelling mean? It means forcing you through direct transactions by withdrawing your funds out of the account for the emergency that is happening. They can't do that if you don't have your money in there and it's in gold and it's buried to who knows where. 
If you're intent, and gold always goes up. Gold has never lost money in any uh, five-year cycle. If their intentions are not yet obvious, then the following report from Zero Head should make it perfectly clear. It says, at this stage, a sane person might be tempted to call it a day on the monetary experiments, especially considering that at this point the limits have been reached. But that's not what's happening. Not at all. It says, if you eliminate physical currency and force people to use debit card linked to government-controlled bank accounts for all transactions, you can effectively centrally plan everything. Consumers not spending, not a problem. Just tax their excess account balance. Okay, economy overheating, again, no problem. Raise the interest rate paid on account holdings to encourage people to stop spending. That is, leave your money in the bank because now they're giving you more of it. Do you want to have to dance when they tell you to? Because I just told you how to get out of it. They can ban cash and you can still buy gold, silver, and platinum and keep it and say that you bought anything you wanted. Do it with a money order. Sign any name you want on the money order and guess what? It's done. There's no paper trail. Merry Christmas. That's why it's called The Correct Views. Um, friends, we're going to move on rather quickly. What I just gave you there, that bit of knowledge, that is gold, by the way. That is absolute pure gold. What Peter Schiff said to Bernanke, this is rather interesting because Ben Bernanke has always been so quick to stand up for his policies, which have been wrong, and very Keynesian. We've mentioned what that is. Very Keynesian in practice. Well, listen to this. Uh, Peter Schiff got to meet Ben Bernanke, and he did everything he possibly could to blow him off. He really did. He tried so hard. It says, speaking of a clueless Federal Reserve, I happened to have an encounter the other day with former Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke. Many of you have seen the picture of me that would be Schiff and former chairman. They were at a cocktail party. And it says uh, he was paid somewhere around two hundred to $250,000 to basically hit softball questions that were lobbed at him by Anthony Sakamuki, who was the host of this conference. At least make the guy do something for $200,000. Like, let me question him. He says, I was watching from the speaker's lounge. He walks out, and he's accompanied by his secretary. He doesn't have a big entourage. I see him, and I come right up to him and say, Mr. Bernanke. I put my hand out and say, Peter Schiff. I can sense from his body language and the way that he looked that the name was at least familiar. I think that he knew something about me, but he didn't necessarily acknowledge it. I think he said something like, oh, sure, but I was pretty sure he knew that I, who I was at that point. The first thing he said to him was, look, I got to let you know, full disclosure, I'm probably your biggest critic, to which Ben Bernanke implied, well, you've got a lot of competition, and that's probably true. There's a lot of competition. There are a lot of people who criticize Ben Bernanke, but not quite as much as Schiff does. It says, after the brief exchange, I said, do you have a moment to chat? I'd love to talk to you. And he said, no, I don't. I really have to go. So, of course, they parted, but he said later that evening at a cocktail party for the speakers, he saw him standing by himself, Ben Bernanke. So he got, I got a drink, he writes, and then went over to Ben, Mr. Bernanke, who was still standing by himself, surprisingly. I said, Mr. Bernanke, I thought you had to leave. He said, no, I'm still here. I've got time for the picture now, because he had asked about taking a picture prior, if you want to take one. Goes on, which I thought was quite nice of him, because he remembered that I wanted a photograph, and he didn't have time for it. Now he sees me, and he asks if I would like to take a photograph. Once they got the picture out of the way, he talked to him, and the first thing he wanted to do, it says, was to give him his version of why the economy is so screwed up and why everything is wrong. The last thing he wanted to get was a lecture from me, he writes, that would be Bernanke, but that's what I tried to give him. I tried to give him the cliff note version, and I said, I want to ask him some questions, but I wanted to get his reaction on my take. Quote, I started talking about the housing bubble and the financial crisis and how the Federal Reserve caused with its low interest rates. He said that no, it wasn't that at all, that the interest rates had nothing to do with it. He first told me that the housing bubble, which crashed the economy in 08, it said the housing bubble was caused by Fannie Mae and Freddie. At least he was laying the blame on the government. Those are, for those of you that don't know, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are government institutions. Uh, it said, look, Fannie and Freddie have been around since the 1930s. We didn't have that big housing bubble until the Fed happened to ha have interest rates at 1% and then raised them very slowly. That wasn't a coincidence. He said, 
Well, it's, it was the subprime mortgages that did it. That's people that maybe got loans when they shouldn't have and then got reamed when their interest rate went up to unimaginable levels. Uh, Schiff said, the subprime mortgages, he asks, do you understand how subprime mortgages worked? They were all adjustable rates. That's uh, uh, adjustable rate mortgages, uh, known as ARMS. And uh, you, would, you would get into a rate, say, at 10% that you could afford. You would be doing wonderful. Then they would greedily ask you for 20%. That doubled your payments. You couldn't do it. They took your house and all the money you paid. It says, do you understand how subprime mortgages work? They were all adjustable rates. But the most popular feature that made them so enticing and affordable was the teaser rate, what they suckered them in with. It said the fact that you can get a low rate of interest for first few years, that was because of the Fed. So if you're going to blame subprime, you've got to blame the Fed, because the Fed is what gave life to subprime. It made subprime affordable. In other words, they suckered people into it. It says that... Uh, he said that, what regulations are you talking about? And he said, Fannie Freddie, which aren't really regulations, they're agencies. But he was really trying to lay the blame on the housing bubble, on capitalism, because of subprime, and on the government, because of Fannie and Freddie. Freddie. But Schiff, listen how smart Schiff is. He says, wait a minute. If regulation and subprime and Fannie and Freddie, if that's what caused the housing bubble, why didn't you warn us about this in advance? Why didn't you go in 2004 and say, hey, we got a problem. We got these bad regulations. We got Fannie and Freddie. We got subprime. They've created a housing bubble. That's going to be a disaster. Guess what? Bernanke didn't say anything to that. He said the opposite of that. In fact, when he was asked specifically what the house, about the housing bubble, he denied that it existed. If it was being caused by the things that he said, then why didn't he warn us about it? He had almost half a decade because it wasn't caused by those things. Schiff said, I tried to ask him some questions and that's when he really wanted to end the conversation. The first question I said, Mr. Bernanke, you're so sure that you're right. I don't know how you can be so sure because interest rates are still at zero and the Fed's balance sheet has not shrunk. You said you weren't monetizing the debt when you talked to Congress. You said the Fed was going to sell the bonds, but none of them have been sold. They've been rolled over. So how are you claiming victory when you haven't exited? You haven't raised rates. You haven't shrunk the balance sheet. You were wrong in the past. You didn't see the financial crisis coming. You told us that there was no housing bubble. You said subprime was contained. It's a good idea to loan this money to these people. Says you were wrong then, how do you know you're not wrong now? Is there anything that might change your opinion and get you to rethink and maybe admit that your outlook is wrong? Instead of answering the questions, he just patted me on the shoulder and just kind of gave me a little smile and that was it. In other words, when someone knows they're wrong, they will oftentimes try to justify what they did rather than admit that they were wrong. And... When that can't happen, then they will either insult you or just walk away, of which Bernanke chose the latter. Bernanke absolutely got his ass handed to him. And with it, I would say, in the last 34 minutes, I have given you every reason to never again trust Keynesian economics. And I like to think so. I, I like to think that I did so as interestingly as possible. Friends, we are moving on to uh, global warming news here. Do you remember that they said that uh, the pl that there wasn't going to be any ice in Antarctica and uh, it was all going to be gone and all the, the woe is us from Al Gore and all these these morons uh, that think that uh, the planet's warming due to man's activity. And then we got that massive amount of ice that the people that went to study global warming got stuck in the ice. Um, and they said that that was a fluke that it wasn't going to happen again. It was, it was a one-time thing. It was just a fluke at the time, but that we were warming the planet and that we would never see anything like that again. Do you remember that? It was, it was a one-time thing, and we were never, ever going to see it again. Well, guess what? We're seeing it again. Yep. Antarctica has so much sea ice that scientists have trouble getting there. Now, 
we're warming the planet, remember? It, we're, we're boiling. Meanwhile, it's uh, 521, 2015 here in Ohio, and we are absolutely freezing. I wouldn't be surprised if it snowed. Not really, but it's good. I mean, it's freezing out there. It is definitely not summer. It's colder than ever. Antarctica has so much sea ice, scientists have trouble getting there. So, I mean, more proof that all of the dingbats that you listened to who told you that you were in charge of man warming the planet are wrong says that scientists are struggling, because they don't want to admit they were wrong, to stage expeditions to the South Pole because Antarctica sea ice has been growing rapidly and hit record highs. But I thought we were warming the planet, Sam. The UK Guardian reports, and there's a link to it, that 50 scientists have gathered in Tasmania to discuss more accurate ways to predict Arctic sea ice levels so that researchers don't get stuck in the ice when traveling southward. In other words, how do we word this in such a way that everybody doesn't realize that we're full of crap? It says it's quite hard to forecast, but whatever effort we put into improving our ability to forecast sea ice will ultimately pay dividends in terms of savings for national programs, Tony Warby, head of the Antarctic Climate for Ecosystems Cooperative Research Center, told The Guardian. Last year, ships couldn't get anywhere near the Australian Antarctic Division's research site in Antarctica, reports The Guardian. That would be because man is simply not warming the planet. And again, research after research, study after study that isn't funded by the UN proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is in fact the case. It says the Russian research vessel Academic Soklowski got stuck in an ice pack. We reported on that on Christmas Eve of 2013 with 52 passengers. It's happening again, friends. We have so much ice that we can't even get near it. And we're supposed to believe that you driving your car to the amusement park is going to warm the planet. Friends, there's three more stories to get to, including the dumb of the day. I do want to mention just real quick that this is brought to you in part by Mike McLaughlin. Mike McLaughlin writes some of the best short stories that you will ever read. He writes poetry, he does uh, political rants, and he's someone that you're quite frankly going to want to look up. Mike uh, McLaughlin, M-A-C-L-A-U-G-H-L-I-N, 